Hello, my History 125 students. This is your professor, Donald Earl Collins. Today is day one of an eight-week course called Trans um, Technological Transformations. So welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for signing up for the course. Um, I'm not quite sure what folks expect in this particular course because a lot of times I find myself talking to students who think the course is purely about technology, like high-tech. Um, electronic digital type of electronic you know doohickeys you know nice shiny objects like smartphones and um, electrical generators and computers and quantum mechanic type stuff like quantum computers or microwave ovens and you know stuff that is very late 20th and early 21st century and beyond when the course is really about the history, the introduction to the history of technology, which invariably also means an introduction to the history of science and technology. In most schools, this course is in fact called the, the introduction to the history of science and technology. You call it technological transformations because it's shorter and you know it's probably more exciting to students to take a technological transformations course than you know, the history of science and technology, right? An introduction course in that. So there's that. So um, unfortunately for you guys, the course really is sort of a historical rundown about key highlights in the history of science and technology for humankind as a whole. Now, there are a few things I want to get out of the way real quick in terms of expectations for the course, what we should be doing and thinking about week one and possibly for, and into week two as well. Um, the bulk of the course, cover, uh, not this week and not next week, but pretty much from about week three through the end, covers the history of science and technology as it develops, mostly from a European perspective, from about 1300 AD or CE, which is the common era, and is the more technical version of saying AD, to the present. So... You know, we're basically covering six, seven hundred years worth of history in three quarters of the course. This week and next week are about broader themes around the history of the development of science and technology in terms of innovations and, and, and breakthroughs and things of that nature. And those are still primarily from a European perspective, but there is some hint toward things outside of Europe in your readings for the first two weeks at least. So there's that. Um, and by the way, hopefully the powers that be at UMUC, soon to be UMGC, will sort of try to correct this in the next year or so. They're supposedly working on that. Um, but I'm, I'm, right now what I am trying to do is make sure that you are aware of early of weak spots challenges in the course right from the get-go in terms of what my expectations are and what you should expect for yourself as a student at the same time. So I just wanted to get all of that out the way. This week specifically is about a bunch of things. You need to do introduce yourself to me and to the rest of your classmates so that we have an idea of who you are. So I'm not just going, hey there, hi guy, whatever. So we have some sense of who you are. Those instructions are in the announcements in terms of what you know, how to introduce yourself and so on. So follow those instructions. The same thing goes with dealing with discussions and posting discussions. Please do not be scared to post. I mean, 30% of your grade, you know, excuse me, 30%, 40% of your grade is basically online discussion. You don't do your post by the end of the day on Fridays. You don't do your um, follow-ups in terms of responses to other people's initial posts during the weekend and you miss that deadline, and you don't post for a week, and you and you you know end up not having anything posted altogether. That reduces your points. If you just do that, you do that alone, you'll probably end up with a B in the class. And the rest of this stuff is sort of you know <laughs> the kind of stuff that if you basically make a good faith effort at in terms of a C or a higher, you'll probably end up with at least a B overall. If you certainly do the discussion. So I want to make sure that you do that. Now, some people might be fearful, scared, 
have a little bit of anxiety around what if I get this wrong, what if I get that wrong. It's kind of hard to get something wrong if you've actually done the readings because the questions really are not counterintuitive. They're not making you make huge logical leaps. You're basically summarizing the reading with a little bit of attempt at an at historical analysis and addressing a particular question. You have a list of questions to pick from. Pick the one that you think you can answer the best based on the readings that you've done, and you probably will do pretty well. Um, I'm not a particularly hard grader when it comes to this sort of thing. Um, at least I don't think I am. So, you know, just do the best you can in terms of all of that. So, those are just sort of housekeeping things to keep in mind. Please don't plagiarize either. Please don't do that. Um, and don't plagiarize your classmates. Um, if even if I don't know that you plagiarize your classmate, your classmate probably will. So please don't do that. Please try to write in your own words and try to be as clear as possible. That's you know, that's really all we're looking for when it comes to this course. So there's that. Um, you have three things beyond the discussions that you have to do for this week. Really easy sorts of things that will help you add up your points towards a thousand. Um, you know, all of your grades are based on a thousand points. If you do your discussion grades are 50 points a week times eight, that's 400 points. That's 40 percent of your grade. You have um, you'll earn points this week because of things like posting your latest um, certificate for authentic, you know, excuse me, for academic integrity. So. There's that. You'll get points for that. You'll get points for being able to answer a series of questions, not one word answers regarding um, the things that are around, you know, rules, do's and don'ts around discussions. Please do not give yes or no and one word answers or choppy answers. Write in bullets if you must. Write full sentences if you think you need to, but do not just give me a one-word answer. Is this the X, Y, Z? Yes. Well, does that, that doesn't really mean much if the answer is just yes, right? So yes and just, you know, tell me what you're doing regarding the discussion in terms of what you're supposed to do and versus what you're not supposed to do, right? Um, and it's all there. Literally, the entire... Um, apparatus around doing an online discussion is explained in the discussion section in Leo for this course. The same thing go goes for the syllabus. The syllabus is pretty standard. There's nothing particularly exciting and innovative about it. Just read the syllabus and figure out what the rules of the road are in terms of your assignments, in terms of expectations, in terms of goals, in terms of you know, the theme sort of course should be able to do all of those. That gets you out between that and the discussion. You have 200 and something, I think 225 points comes from all of that from the first week alone, right? So you're past week one, you're almost a quarter of the way through the total things that get graded in the course. You participate in discussion on a regular basis, you pass the course, even if you do nothing else particularly great you pass the course you know you get you do well on even one of the two remaining assignments that's probably a B or close to it you do well on both of them it's probably a B or an A so there's that and those assignments aren't even due till weeks four and eight I'm not talking about those today so please feel free by the way to email me at donald.collins at faculty dot UMUC, soon to be UMGC, I'm assuming, .edu. I'll let you know when that changes, because that's supposed to change in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So, this week in particular, in terms of content, in terms of the readings, in terms of discussions about the notion of progress and technological change and transformation, a lot of the questions center on ancient Greece and Rome, but by the time ancient Greece and Rome are, have come around, Human civilizations or have been around probably for a neighborhood of anywhere from two to six thousand years, depending on what part of the world you're thinking about. And the agricultural revolution, which starts as early as thirteen thousand BCE in what is now Turkey, picks up with a lot of steam between roughly eight thousand and six thousand BCE and the rest of what we now call the Near East or the Middle East, Northern Africa, and particularly Northeastern Africa, 
parts of South Asia, which basically Pakistan, Afghanistan, and northern India, um, China, um, in parts of South America and Central America as early as about 4000 BCE. Um, so we're talking thousands of years before the Greeks and before the Greeks and before the Romans. Their people have been figuring out farming, domesticating animals, storing food, you know, figuring out how to get rid of waste, clean water, all of those sorts of things, right? All the things that have led to what we consider human humanity's progress or human progress in the millennia since. So you know, that's to sort of branch out your thinking beyond just Europe, 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 and Greece and Rome in this particular case, even though some of your readings specifically deal with Greece and Rome. But you have other readings, like the Jared Diamond reading, like the reading on Southernization, that talks about how, when, it really talks about one of the key themes for the Course, which is the, our interdependence on other people's discoveries and the, the chain of custody toward an invention or toward a technological transformation for a particular society or set of societies or particular scientific innovations and scientific ideas that lead to such things, right? Then in other words, this idea that one guy created this great thing and no one ever made any modifications to it so that people could use it is pretty much a false idea, right? Thomas Edison didn't do most of what he did by himself. Alexander Graham Bell, the same thing. Um, Archimedes, Archimedes um, the guy who created the screw that you could um, pump water from deep wells, you know, using basic mechanical principles, um, didn't do his work literally all by himself. That he either did his work on the basis of other people's work and advances in screws and um, pulls and levers and raising water from, you know, against gravity and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, so if they did a lot of work on their own, their, their work is, you know, built on the foundation of other people's work. Or they had help while they were doing their work. That's one of the key themes of this course is that no civilization is doing everything whole cloth. No one's sitting around going, hey, let's create everything from scratch. I mean, the closest you get to that are pretty much the Mayans um, and the Olmecs who, you know, because of their isolation from the rest of the world from the Eastern Hemisphere and what is the Western Hemisphere in Central and South America, they're able to do a lot of things on their own. You know, but even they are not doing every single thing on their own. They have some sort of technological and, uh, and biological knowledge of the world that they come with from the Eastern Hemisphere to the Western Hemisphere before the land bridge is closed during the last ice age from about 15,000 years ago. Anyway, point being that even they are starting from a basis of not zero, right? And there's a tendency in this course to think that people are doing everything on their own when they, in fact, are not. And so there's that theme that sort of southernization deals with. There's also the theme of progress, right? That just because someone has an innovation and is generally a positive one doesn't mean that there aren't negatives to that innovation. Jared Diamond covers that in great detail in terms of the worst mistake in human history, his article from 1987. He basically has two other books that deal with some of these same themes, too. The book called um, Collapse and the book uh, called Guns, Germs, and Steel. They both deal with this issue that progress isn't always positive, that progress can also be negative, and that there is no, there's that, that this European notion of linear progress. We just keep building and building and getting things get better and better and better over time. There's also a false, no, false notion. You can have a lot of progress, and then civilizations rise and fall. Empires rise and fall. And because of due to famine, due to disease, due to invasion from other groups, due to enslavement, due to just the civil war and collapse, Rome's, the Roman Empire is a classic example of it. So you go through periods of time where there isn't as much progress. And in fact, there might be a downshift in, in progress in, in a particular society or particular region of the world as a result of the collapse of governments. Um, lack of technological transformation as a result, or less of it. 
and it, you know, so it's not all linear, it's not all circular, and that's Jared Diamond's idea too. So, in other words, complicate your view. Be open to having some of your views about techn technological transformation and who's involved and why and the challenge. Be more willing to see that this is something that is integrated that involves um, cross-cultural dialogue, transformation, trade in order for one group of people to have the ideas from another group of people and build on it in terms of technologies and scientific breakthroughs. Be willing to have that idea that progress is not linear and continual challenged as well through some of these readings. And that will help you get a good start in terms of what this course is all about.